Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Julie Alcoholic. Julie. And apparently I'm shorter than Josh. Uh, it's funny, you know, um, I'm always told to be grateful, you know, and I, driving down here to see it today, I didn't feel very grateful, you know, I'm like, oh my God, I, you know, I, I, I left my house at like two o'clock and I got to where we were going at like six o'clock and uh, I was so frustrated by the time I got there and um, had to get some food and I suddenly realized I was hungry, you know, like, I don't know if it ever happens to you guys, you know, but my mood shifts when I'm hungry and then I don't realize I'm hungry, I think you're being an idiot. Uh, and then I get, I eat something, I go, oh God, I feel much better now. So luckily for you lot, I've eaten. So, whew, so the accent is Irish and, uh, you know, I, I was raised in this, uh, home. There was, my mother had 13 children. Uh, I know. Imagine how I felt. And, uh, and seven died, and there were six left, so I was the second youngest, so keep up, right? So, uh, so that's, you know, my, and I was crazy, it was a crazy house, you know. And my mother really should have never had any children. She really hasn't got a maternal bone in her body. Like, and she, she knows it, she knows it. I'm not telling her something she doesn't know, right? But I was in the, I was on an escalator at one time, and this really heavily pregnant woman was coming up the escalator, and, uh, I look at I look at my mother and I look at her and my mother goes, Jesus, someone had it in for her. <laughs> like, I, and I said, well, maybe she wants to be pregnant, Mammy. And she looked at me horrified. She goes, Julie, nobody wants to be pregnant. So <laughs> I know there's a girl here pregnant tonight. So <laughs> I'm sure your case is different. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, but I, but my, you know, my. My mother was not friendly or, like, warm and fuzzy is where I'm going with that. And so, like, I was raised in a home where there was um, there was a lot of, ag- lot of aggression. And uh, if you understand this, there was a lot of aggression but no discipline. Like, uh, my mother was involved in her own alcoholism, and so she was preoccupied. And as long as, and she was involved in some criminal activity, and as long as, she, I, I know, and so as long as she, we didn't bring the cops to the house, we were sweet. Like, education wasn't important. My father was illiterate. My mother's semi-illiterate. My mother was married at 15 and had a child every year for 13 years. So, uh, a, a very smart woman, but no education. And so, like, these things weren't important. And, um, and so I was, I just kind of did what I felt like doing. Uh, you know, and I often think that, you know, like I went home to Ireland uh, to live eight years ago and I realized that as an adult, like the Irish naturally are so undisciplined. Like they'll go, uh, like I was saying, I was saying earlier to somebody, I'd take a day off of work because a guy would be coming to do a job and I'd say, where are you? It's 12 o'clock. And he'd say, Jesus, was that today? Oh, sorry, love. I'll come tomorrow. And I'm like, well, no, I'm not taking tomorrow off. I'm ta- I've taken today off. Oh, don't be getting yourself upset. So I realized, <laughs> like what? So, uh, like as a nation, we just do what we feel like. And 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 I, the way I, the reason I share that is that when I got sober, I just lacked anything to do with commitment or discipline. And if you've been sober longer than five minutes, you know that it takes a little bit of commitment and discipline if we're going to do the deal. And. Uh, that was totally alien to me and uh, took me a long time to get there. Uh, you know, for me, um, I started, you know, my mother used to drink in this. My mother left my father and when I was about four. We went to London to live and, and my mother used to drink in this bar. Uh, the locals used to call it Maggot's Corner because you know how we roll. And, uh, and it was actually called the White Heart. And, um, and I'd go up after school with my younger sister, and we'd spend the evening there. And um, my mother would be the only woman there, and it'd be all Irish men, you know, all melancholy guys. And uh, the Irish are like that. Oh, the old country, you know. So, um, you know, I used to sit on these guys' laps, you know, 
And I learned at a very early age, if I got, I'd get a swig of their beer or 50 pence, you know what I mean, 50 cents. And I'd like to think I've kept myself in reasonable good nick. I'd like to think I'd at least get a quarter if I ever relapsed and went back into the bar. But, but what that taught me, I'm just going to hold that there. Keeps me hopeful. Uh, you know, so I'm just entertaining myself. Um, anyway, I'll get back to my story. Uh, so, you know, uh, <laughs> What that did for me, I got very familiar in bars and very comfortable. I'm, I, I'm a bar fly, just like my mother, just like my family. Like, that's where I like to, I like to, to, to be. And, uh, and I'm, I'm really comfortable. And, um, it's horrifying when you first get sober. You think, well, what do you do with all that time? Like, I mean, I still went down to the bar and I bought you drinks. Do you know what I mean? And I'm like getting drunk through you. Get that down. Yeah, do you need another one? And I'm like, no, Jesus, slow down. Come on. Like, like, I'd be broke at the end of the night and sober. It's just wrong. And angry because I'm broke and sober. <laughs> and <laughs> so, you know, uh, when I think about independently drinking, I started to kind of independently start drinking, which means sealing it, when I was about 10. My mother had this drinks cabinet, and, and it had these magnets. Do you remember them cupboards that went click, click? And I'd open that, you know, and I, I could open the cupboard without the magnets making that click, click noise. And I thought it was a gift from Jesus, you know. I mean, I, Jesus wants me in here. Like, you know how you guys are when you get a parking spot? Jesus organized this for me. I, I felt the same. So don't pretend you guys don't identify. So um, you're like, no, I don't do that. We know you do. Uh, so like I, the, and the one thing booze did for me, you know, it made me, I was, if you can't tell, very, very intense and concerned. I was concerned a lot. And when I got sober, uh, I'll be 23 years sober uh, in April, and when I got sober, uh, in my first 10 years of sobriety, I had two ulcers because I got very concerned again. But when when I drank, I lost that totally. Like, I suddenly became indifferent. And I loved that feeling. Like, I wasn't interested in your sad little life and your sad little you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. And I loved that. And so that tension just rolled off me and I started to become super indifferent. And, you know, my mom used to um, smuggle over putcheen. You guys call it moonshine. But she'd smuggle over putcheen is the Irish, right? And she'd she'd put it in, you know, those um, holy water bottles, the blessed, you know, the blessed Virgin Mary, you know, you know how it is. You know, like you put the water in, you're feeling a bit queer, you bless yourself. I did that quite a bit. And, uh, anyway, my mother used to pour out the holy water and she'd pour in putcheen because it's a clear liquid. And she'd have all these statues going through customs from Ireland to England. She'd have all these statues lined up in the back of the car. It looked like full of holy water and all these children in the car. And, uh, and she just like some, looked somebody who was like super religious. Do you know what I mean? They'd be flagging her throat. And so anyway, she'd put these statues of Mary in that little bar that I got to open. And when my mother had begun out, which she was daily, my mother was a daily drinker, same as I was, I'd open that cabinet and I'd try and find the crown on Mary's head. And then I'd take Mary down, I'd screw the head off Mary, I'd have a swig, and I'd put Mary's head back on. And you know, right? <laughs> you know when you when you drink that stuff, you can't breathe. Like, you know that, right? You're like, you're like <gasps> Like, it rains are popping out, but you know it's going to be worded. I mean, it is sweet once that, that initially not being able to breathe passes. You're in the zone. And, like, I'd put Mary back up in the cupboard, and I'd be delighted with myself for, like, 20 minutes. I'm like, oh, that's grand now, lovely. And I'd smoke some cigarette butts or some old cigar butts. And I'd be delighted for myself. About 20 minutes later, I'm like, hmm, I wonder if Mary's still in the cupboard. <laughs> Back over, back over to Mary. And, and, and my drinking was off and running. Like, I love booze. I felt so arrogant and so indifferent in booze. And, and, and I don't know about this invisible line business, right? I just know, both my parents are alcoholic, but still drinking. My mother is anyway, but, um, you know, I don't know about this invisible line business. I never really had an invisible line. Once I started drinking, that was it. I was off and running, like the obsession. When I'm not drinking, I'm thinking about drinking. And when I'm not drinking and thinking about drinking, I'm getting over drinking. That's how it was until I got sober at 24. 
And, and so like, there's always booze in my house. And I started to drink at school. And I'd, I'd go over, and I was, obviously I'm Catholic, I'm Irish, right? So, uh, the shock if you're not. And, uh, and I, and there was a little, there was a little corner store opposite my school, and I'd go over in my uniform, and I'd buy four cans of wine. Cans of wine. Like, I don't think I'd ever even really seen a grape, you know what I'm saying? And I, <laughs> like, I'd bring them into the toilets at lunch. And now I've, like, I've eaten into 15 minutes of my break. I've got another 45 minutes. I'm pounding down those cans alone in the toilet. That should have been a clue, right? Like, because like, I'm not a sharer. I've got enough going on sharing at home, so I'm not sharing my booze. I never was a sharer. It just irritates me when people want to share my, my stuff. Uh <laughs> Especially my booze. And, uh, you know, so I get those four cans down me. And, like, I'm cursed being Irish because I, when I drink, I go, like, red, almost kind of purple from here all the way up. And my eyes are like, uh, do you ever see, like, piss holes in the snow? Do you ever see that? <laughs> so I'm like this. And I'm bright red. They're, like, kind of back up, like, whoop, whoop. You know what I mean? Like, are you all right? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. <laughs> you know, like, uh, it was such a curse. I used to pray all the time for that not to happen. But it did, unfortunately. Sad, I know. Uh, you know, but, so, so that, I'd get into trouble at school. And I always share this. And it's really interesting to me how many people identify. Um, and I believe it's part of my alcoholism. As soon as I started drinking, I suddenly got an obsession to cut myself. I was a huge, I used to cut myself. It was a huge cutter all the way through my drinking. And I'd hide it. That's how unwell I was from the gate. That's why I don't know about this invisible line business. That's how unwell I was from the 10, 10 years of age. I start drinking. That seems like a good idea to me. And I hid it, tried to hide it all the way through my drinking. Of course, when I got too drunk at times, uh, I had to go to the doctors, whatever, you know. Um, but it was always part of my drinking. And um, so I was really crazy, and I started to um, get into a bit of trouble. And I left home when I was about 19, and I started to work in the East End of London. I left school with no education, and I went to work in a hospice in the East End of London, the Irish Sisters of Charity, God love them. And uh, I lived there, like two doors down. I always want to sing that Dolly Parton song, you know. Two doors down, they're laughing and drinking and having a party. Two doors down, they're not they're not aware that I'm around. You know what I mean? I was already feeling sorry for myself, so I'd be singing Dolly, you know. And uh, and I I asked the I asked the sisters if they would put me on the floor with the other sisters, because I was going to become a nun. That's right, people. And. They said yes, which was their first mistake. And so they, so they put me on the floor with the other, with the other sisters. And, um, I started to get into a lot of trouble. That room, right, it was like, um, a six by three. I still remember it was like blue curtains, blue bin, green carpet, small little, small little bed, and a sink. And I had a huge wardrobe, and in that wardrobe was a padlock. And like my room was immaculate. I wouldn't even use the bin, like the trash can, I wouldn't even use it. And I would have up at the top my booze and my blades and then my clothes would be thrown in the bottom. And that's how I lived. But like it looked immaculate, like you could eat off the floor. But that was really, that cupboard really represented me. <laughs> and nobody was going to get to see that. And so my drinking took off. I started to, to drink more and more. And I was I was leaving the unit to drink this suddenly had a flashback of um Sanatogen wine. Sanatogen wine in, 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 in London is a vitamin wine. And I thought, I need this because, you know, I'm not eating a lot. And I'd, every, <laughs> every hour I'd go back to my room and drink bottles of this Sanatogen wine. You know, I'd be so drunk all the way through my shifts. And I, I started to get into it, and I thought it was healthy because it was vitamins, right? You know how we are. And uh, I started to get into a lot of trouble. And, and people would be dying because it's a hospice. And I'd say to the other Irish girls who were there, do you want, yes, I'm so sorry, do you want to go for a drink? Like I'd be homing in on girls who'd be upset that someone passed away. And I'd be like, oh, do you want to go for a drink? And I did that for a couple of months. And then I got fed up. Like I felt like I'm entertaining you. I'm entertaining you when I go out. I don't want to entertain you. Drinking is my time. Like I can see now how booze started to get me more and more and more and more insular. 
more and more insulated. I'd find out where you were going, I'd go somewhere else. I hated girls my own age because they were just like high maintenance, do you know what I'm saying? And they want to do stuff. And I just want to sit at the bar drinking. That's what I want to do. Uh, I want to be locked in at night. After closing hours, they lock you in and you help clean the toilets and the ashtrays and they keep you in there on three in the morning because I worked in the hospice and the police police station was right there. We'd all be in there drinking until three, four o'clock in the morning. I'd get up at seven o'clock again in the morning. I'd go and have a huge big fry up for my breakfast because then, you know, it lines your stomach. And then I'd go into work. And um, and that's how it was. And I started to get into a lot of trouble. I started to um, get crazier and crazier, like more and more aggressive. I became very violent in these. And um, anything that I ever had of value that people gave me, I smashed up. I smashed and broke anything that was of value to me. I started to get more and more violent and um, more and more resentful. And I have, still do, a hair trigger. Like, anger has been something I've had to work on really hard. Now, I'm not talking like a little bit, oh, you hurt my feelings. No. Like, I'm talking jumping out the car while it's gone because now I need to strangle you. Because you just won't stop talking and you're just constantly talking. Like, whoo, that was so hard. Like, and let me tell you, anybody, anybody who's single in here and thinks you're spiritually fit, you get in a relationship and find out how fit you are. Because when you add sex to the mix, it's on. <laughs> Theory is a lovely thing. I sponsees who live alone. <laughs> and I go, theory is a lovely thing. <laughs> when you start, what was the, you want to know how well I am, ask my partner. Right? That's how it is. That's how it is. But, you know, so I, I you know, for me, I was getting into a lot of trouble. And I, I used to... Um, I'd be in, I'd be in my room drinking and cutting myself and I'd be singing Guns N' Roses, you know. Turn around, bitch, I got use for you. Besides, you ain't got nothing better to do and I'm bored and I'm crazed in the room like, yeah, yeah. Like I'm alone. I'm alone. Like I never needed any si- siblings really, but you know, um, and, and sister and God love her be tapping on my sister and I should be like, She'd be like, Julie, love you, okay. And I'm crazed in the room. Like purple, eyes are out. I'm like, you know, crazy. And uh, I started to get into a lot of trouble. And I used to end up, I used to, um, at night, we'd put all our trash cans outside the door, right? And I'd put all my empties in Sister Anne's trash can. She was just like, so funny. <laughs> what would, I don't people think badly of me. And uh, I, I have, I still have, you know, some self-esteem. And, um, and I'd hear the domestic staff. My accent is from the Midlands in Ireland. And the Cork girls, an accent I'm going to do now is the girls who come from Cork. They're all in the domestic thing. And I'd hear them going, Jesus, girl, did you see Sister Anne's bin? I think she's a bit of an alky. And I'm like, ah, it's hilarious. I just thought it was funny. Uh, I woke up one morning, there was a, there was a bright, glow-in-the-dark job. I mean, turn off the lights, you'll find me. Uh, I, don't, I often wonder if they do condoms in that colour, but anyway, that's that'd be a whole different meeting. Uh, anyway, I just wondered, like, you know, turn off the lights, here I am. Uh, I know, I lost half the room, it's fine. Uh, I'm just playing. Uh, it was a long drive, you know. I get a little... It's a long drive. So, you know, I had this bright, glow-in-the-dark tracksuit. And I'd shaved my hair. This is this is quite long tonight. Yeah. Yes, sir. And I have mascara on. So, you know, I'm very girly. You too can get in touch with your femininity when you get sober. And, uh, you know, I had my hair shaved on a number one. And um, I used to have this cherry tracksuit. Because I always thought, you know, if I did that, I, I realized now it was fear. But I was drinking in the East End of London with all all men, and I was coming out of blackout, I'm a huge blackout drinker, all times in the morning, night and day, didn't know where I was and who I was with, and so I thought, if I put this tracksuit on and shave my hair and walk like a bloke, they're going to think that I'm a bloke, now, like, I have a set of twins under my top, right, so, <laughs> like, so no matter what I wear, no tracksuit is covering, it's certainly not a glow-in-the-dark job one. <laughs> It's like you're like a heat-seeking missile, do you know what I mean? But you don't think... And I'm bright red, I match my top, so... 
And I think I'm like covert. <laughs> this is how out of touch I was with reality. And, and you know, I'd be, I'd go drinking and then I'd go over to evening prayer because I'm still committed about becoming religious. And, uh, and the sisters would be singing and I'd be at the back like lit up like a Christmas tree and, and they'd be like singing and I'd think, oh, they can't hold a tune. Poor sisters, I'm going to help the girl, I'm going to help the sisters out, you know what I'm saying? And so I'm like, I'm in the back going, Salve Regina, Mata Misericordia, Vite du Tredo, Espes Nostra Salve. Right? And that, thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm here all week. Uh, so, <laughs> so the, the, these sisters had turned around and I thought they were turning around going, Damn, thanks for helping us out. <laughs> now, and I'm like, I know. Right? Now I know they were like, oh my God, what is that? So I, <laughs> like, I was just such a moron. <laughs> and I was getting into a lot of trouble and I, I, isn't that a horrible idea when you get to a place where you have to try to enjoy and control your drinking? Like, what's that all about? I've never been able to manage that. And I really don't want to. The same as I don't understand why you wouldn't drink daily. I just don't understand. Let's take a break for a month. Why? <laughs> it's not, it's not part, I just don't get it. Uh, anyway, I ended up trying to control and enjoy my drinking by swimming. Every day I'd do a split shift at work. And so I'd be hungover, I'd go into work for a couple of hours. And then I'd go straight down to the swimming pool. I'm a huge swimmer, I still am. I swim about four or five miles a week quietens my head down, quiet, because I'm wired, right, that's why sitting in the car for four hours makes me a little antsy, because I'm wired, and uh, still wired, and uh, you know, I, I'd i go down and I'd swim a hundred laps in 80 minutes, and I know, and uh, and then I'd go down and have double whiskey, double whiskey, double whiskey, back to work, <laughs> and uh, I was getting thrown off that unit, I was fighting, I thought it was funny one day after doing that, there was a big Fijian woman, now I must have been drunk because she was a big girl, and she was sitting down, which is the only way I could do what I did, but I thought it would be funny to cut her hair. Isn't that hilarious? <laughs> it's funny, right? She didn't think so. The, as we say in Ireland, there was hair flying. We, I mean, I cut her hair, I was like, ah, oh, she went, hell no. <laughs> Damn, <laughs> this might have been a poor impulse decision. Uh, so I was getting into a lot of trouble, and I, you know... I was, I was coming out of blackout, didn't know where I was. People, people were strapping me down to the floor and I'm, I'm beating people up and I'm using, I'm using my chair in the room as a toilet and I'm cutting myself so badly I can't stop the, the bleeding and, and I'm disoriented and I am now crawling up the corridor to knock on the girl's ward to say, I'm sorry, can you tell them I can't work today? That's how, that's how it was. And, um, oh, I ended up going on a trip to, um, the, the, um, the Great Barrier Reef, one of the seven wonders of the world. I saw an advert for Castle Main Forex and things was kind of getting hot where I was. And I decided to go. It was just before my 21st birthday. And I go to one of the Great Barrier, go to the Great Barrier Reef. Don't know anybody there. Just take off. And I'm on a glass bottom boat in the Great Barrier Reef, one of the seven wonders of the world. And, um, I have long sleeves on me because I've been cutting myself really badly and I'm drinking a can of Foster's. And there's girls my age. And they're, they're going, they're, they're, they're wandering along and they're like, there's girls my age and they're like, oh, let's go snorkeling, right? And I'm thinking, look at those silly cows. Look at them. Aren't they pathetic? Now the truth was, I'm sitting there with, with, with cuts all up my arm so, uh, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't get in a bikini and I felt bad about my body. Now I look at pictures when I was 20 and I was banging, you know what I'm saying? But, <laughs> At the time, you don't think you're banging, right? I'm like, oh my god, I'm so fat. Uh. Like now, I, now I'd kind of like that body back, but you know, that's that ship has sailed and uh, <laughs> it's left the port. And uh, you know, from and I'm taking their inventory, but I am taking pictures of that beautiful can of Foster's because let's face it, it's a good-looking can. I mean, it's a beautiful blue, isn't it? I mean, the blue is just. The blue is right there, and the kangaroo is silver, and the little stars are red, and the sun is hitting it. Now, I'm on I'm on one of the seven wonders of the world, and I have a lot of pictures of that can of Foster's, 
And I have no pictures of one of the seven wonders of the world. That'll tell you where I was around obsession. and Things just got worse for me. And um, I ended up getting to a point where drinking... You know where you drink a bottle of whiskey and you can't escape your head? Like, you know where your body is drunk and your head is wide awake? That is a horrible place to be. And, uh, and that's where I was. And um, drinking myself sober and... Um, Horrible place to be. I'm, I'm places where I'm wetting myself and I'm, people are taking advantage of me and I'm going, oh my God, where am I? Oh my God, who is this guy? Oh my God, I can't move. And I'm drunk. I can't move from the neck down, but my head is wide awake. And it was a horrible spot for me to be in. And, um, I had what they call, like the big book talks about the jumping off place when I was 21. Somebody had upset me and I told you that's not difficult. And, um, I came out of a, I came out of the unit and I went into my room and I cracked open a bottle of whiskey and I'm drinking a bottle of whiskey. I'm looking out the window and I'm singing Patsy Cline, you know, today I sat alone at a window. I don't want to play house. No, I don't want to play house. Like I'm crazy. I'm getting myself all wild up. I'm drinking this bottle of whiskey. I go over to the sink and I cut myself really badly. Boom. And I'm suddenly struck sober, suddenly struck sober. And I realize I can't live with booze and I can't live without it. And I picked up the booze and drank for another three and a half years. And my last drink, um, I was 24 and a half. And um, it was in April in 1993. And um, I was living in a convent, a retreat center by the Ursuline nuns. And it was all going to be different. I wasn't going to drink anymore. I wasn't going to hurt myself. I was going to get spiritually fit. It lasted two days. Two days is what lasted. And they called the doctor out to me. It was a horrible nine months for those women. And um, my last drink, apparently, in blackout, I went into the chapel and I told Sister Anne where to go in front of 60 young people. And I'd cut myself, so I was bleeding all over the carpet. I don't remember any of it, but I remember when I woke up the next morning. I took inv- inventory of my room. The room was all smashed up. Uh, I was throwing up. I was bringing up blood. And I'm on my knees in the toilet and I decide to kill myself because I know I'm a loser. And I don't say that lightly. I was a total loser. I'd never, I'd never paid a bill or worked anywhere that they didn't take your, all the bills out first and then give you your money. Right? I never driven a car. I'd never had a relationship. I mean, I had some stalking experiences. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I like a good obsession. Same as the next person, especially when I'm in charge of it. Uh, but I'd never had a relationship, and I was terrified of people, and I didn't know. I knew I was a loser. I was. And so I made a decision to kill myself that morning, and I went upstairs. I'm drinking some hot water. It's what I always drank when I was hungover. And um, the the guy, there was a guy there, and it turns out he was an Irish guy, and he was sober, nine months in Alcoholics Anonymous, and he'd, he'd seen me perform the night before, and so he... He 12-stepped me that morning, and I just made a decision to kill myself. So, you know, what do I care? And, and uh, the only reason I listened to him was because he was Irish. Because I thought that was the problem. I thought it was because, you know, everybody else I live with was British. And we know the British are kind of anal, right? Like, they're not like the Irish. Like, we like to have a good time, you know what I mean? Uh, let our hair down a little bit. It's cultural. And uh, he 12-stepped me, and he brought me to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it was on a Wednesday night in the East, in London. Um, it was an 8.30 meeting on Wednesday night, and um, I hadn't had a drink for four days, and that was the longest I'd ever gone without a drink, four days. And he brings me to this meeting. It's a really small meeting, and um, it was so smoky, it was anonymous. You know what I mean? It was like, like you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. People swearing and carrying on. Some guy was selling t-shirts out the back of his car. You know what I'm saying? I got one. Um, <laughs> keep coming back. You know, uh, so I don't know if I identified and I didn't know if I was alcoholic. I just knew that when I drank, I couldn't stop drinking and I was in trouble and I could never finish anything. I could never achieve anything and I never showed up for anything. And I was totally unemployable at this stage. Uh, they let me stay in the convent there because uh, I really couldn't hold a job. I was crazy, and I was I was fiery, like I was fiery, you know, unpredictable. I think they call that. And uh, and so I went to this meeting, and the woman gave me her gave me a big book and wrote her name in it, and I'm immediately suspicious because you know, like the men are much more friendlier than the women, and uh, probably more malleable, which is what is what I like, and. Uh, the women, and she was kind of kind. She was nice to me. Gave me this book, and she told me to call her. 
And I wake up the next morning, and I don't think, I never thought like I've arrived or I'm home. I just knew that I was in trouble. And I didn't understand. I was so, the big book talks about this in a wonderful way. It talks about being befogged. Befogged. What a great, like, I don't know what's happened. I've no clue. I'm totally befogged. And so I, I, Diane, that woman who gave me that book, what do they always say? Be careful how you treat a newcomer because one day they could be your sponsor. And it turned out I wouldn't have stayed sober if it wasn't for Diane. And when I was about two years sober, she relapsed. And when I was about five years sober, she asked me to sponsor her. So, it, like, I would have never stayed sober. She was kind to me. And let me tell you, I was not likable. I know you find that very hard to believe. I was not likable. I mean, I was abrasive. Uh, I was aggressive. I was, um, like, I didn't know how to speak to people. And I was super judgmental. And um, couldn't hear anything. And I ended up, um, I started to walk to these meetings in my cherry tracksuit. I'd walk to these meetings, right? And it was a two and a half hour meeting to this, walk to this meeting. Our sponsees now won't walk around the corner for Christ's sake. And it's California. I'm talking London, right? So I'm walking. And, and I, this is my first experience of any kind of discipline at all. I'm walking about three months sober. And, and as I'm walking, these cars are tooting their horn. And I'm flipping the bird. Because I'm like, they want a piece of this. Do you know what I'm saying? Eh. Right? Now, like, now I know that nobody wanted a piece of that, right? But at the time, I thought they did. And so I'd get to the meeting, and these guys would say to me, Jesus, Julie, I saw you uh, walking. <laughs> and I took the horn, I was going to pull over, and you flipped me the bird, and I thought, well, feck her, let her walk. And I was like, <laughs> I was suddenly embarrassed. And I, I said, my first experience of having to practice something different. Like, not automatically just doing whatever I felt like. Because when I was drinking, I would tell you what I thought of you. And then I wouldn't give you an opportunity to respond. I'd go, shh, don't speak, you'll spoil it. And I'd walk off. <laughs> just walk off and leave you standing there. Like, did that just happen? Uh, so this is my first experience of people challenging me. Hey, you know, what was that about? Uh, and so I had to start to practice that. And then... I'm not really a joiner. I've always really struggled with being a joiner. And um, I've learned in the fellowship, you know, like I used to think that people were taking advantage of me. Like I'd go to a meeting and people would say, can you can you help put the chairs away? And i go, well, I've put my chair away. Like, and I'm serious. I didn't understand this business of altruism. Uh, and then they'd say, well, you know, could you help, um, you know, pick up the ashtrays? I don't smoke. Like, you know, well, could you help with tea? I don't drink hot beverages, which was a lie. I did, but I didn't want to help them. Like, like I had this problem of committing to anything. Like, I was really worried. Like, I don't mind helping you out tonight because I'm here. What, what, what's that now? What? You want me to commit? What, what's that now? A year? In England, it's a year. A year? A year? Uh, no. Sorry. I don't mind helping you out tonight, but what about something better comes along next Friday? And, uh, then I'll be resentful that I have to be here because I committed and then I just can't come back here anymore. No, it's just way too much trouble. So I would never commit to anything. I was terrified about committing to anything. And I started to, um, I started to learn in the fellowship that in order to, that gets kind of lonely. You know, my attitude was really poor and I just kept you at arm's length. And, um, my behavior hadn't changed. My attitude was still arrogant and, um, and I went through this thing about, when I first got sober, I was either really, really rageful or really, really depressed, like nothing in between. Like I was either here, here, and I was intense. Like people would say to me at the house, morning, Julie, how are you? I go, oh my God, you know, this happened to me when I was five. People were like, Jesus, you know, like, like, like I was intense and I was a hostage taker. Like you asked me how I was and I was going to tell you everything. Like I'm reading my journal to you, you know what I'm saying? The bad one. Which I didn't because I was too undisciplined. Uh, you know, I don't do that. It's a waste of time. Uh, so I, I ended up, you know, from, I didn't read, and I didn't read, um, the literature. I had a hard time reading and writing when I got sober. I learned to read and write when I got sober. And I, a friend of mine, uh, who's a nun helped me with my ABCs. And she showed me how to read a newspaper and she showed me how to use a dictionary. I didn't know any of that stuff. I had very minimal education and, um, and it started to help me. I started to be able to read in, in meetings, and I really had a hard time reading out loud. I love when I hear people struggling reading out loud now, but they're willing to do it. 
It's so hard. But I started to do that. It started to make me feel a little bit better. And then I got a big book, and I was three years sober. I never got a sponsor. And, uh, because, you know, I don't, I don't want to hear from you. I'm not interested. Uh, I just know that when I went to meetings, I felt better. My sponsor now calls that a grace period, right? I had a grace period for three years. And I was on, I was on the train one day, and I opened the big book for the first time. And I was reading where it said, half measures availed us nothing. And I thought for three years that when people read that, they were saying half measures of ale did nothing. <laughs> I swear to God, I read that. I was like, oh, my God, you t- moron. Because I was sharing in meetings, oh, yeah, half measure of ale never did me any good. <laughs> what? So, you know, that, that kind of thing... Uh, I start, you know, I started to kind of do a few things around here. I started to kind of get involved in, in a few little commitments, even though they terrified me. I started to go back to school, which was very new for me. And um, and I'll tell you what happened to me. I got involved in a relationship that I'm still in. We're married now and been together tw- 20, 21 years. And, um, and she's also in the fellowship. And, um, you know, I was in my house and she said something I didn't like. And I kicked the door in her face. Yeah. Now, I can sound good in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I can put it on, but what am I like when no one's watching? Right? Character is built in the dark. And here I was, professing to love somebody, kicking the door in the face. I didn't appreciate their response. Like, I'll tell you how I want you to respond. Like that kind of rage. And I looked at her, and she started crying, and I slid down the wall. I was horrified. And I got a sponsor. I got a sponsor. I was humiliated into getting a sponsor. And um, beaten into it. I got a sponsor. I started going through the steps for the first time, about three years sober. And and let me tell you that I always thought I was the pursued and not the pursuer. I always thought I was the victim. I always thought, and, and trust me, there was a lot I could complain about. I, I had a, I had it rough. Uh, but it's like, I always thought that um, I was just protecting myself. Uh, so I justified that all the way through my life. And, um, and what I found was um, when I did a step four, I was totally indifferent to people. You know, my first step four, there was ten people in it. Ten people. I told you how many siblings I have. There was ten people. Why? Because I'm indifferent. I'm indifferent to you. I'll pretend we're friends. You give me a number, we're best buddies, and then I throw that number away as soon as I'm left and gone. I'm indifferent to you. You don't touch me. You don't touch me. And uh, indifferent. And didn't care for people and, and had a hard time caring for myself. And I wanted perfection the same as you want perfection, and I'd tell you. You know, I was really unlikable. In fact, my wife is very kind. And people would call and they'd say, oh, is Hilda there? I'd be like, oh, how are you? And they'd go, well, actually, I called to talk to Hilda. And I'd be like, oh, <laughs> nobody wants to talk to me. Um, but my first experience of the steps working for me, I looked at, you know, my relationship with my mother and father. And I resented both of them. And trust me, there was a lot to resent. And I resented both of them. And I started to look at what kind of daughter I was. And, and uh, I wasn't. I wasn't. And... Um, I knew the steps were working. I graduated. I got my, my first degree when uh, I was five years sober. And um, I was in Canterbury Cathedral, right? And, and my mother, it was first degree in my family ever. And my mother had flown over from Ireland to Canterbury. And she'd made it. And I knew I was getting well because I saw my mother. I'm, I'm, the trumpets are blowing. I'm walking down the aisle. And, and the hat, I got my hat and gown on. And, and my and I see my mom, she turns around, and she's, she's, she's buff, right? She's hung over a little, and she tore back a little bit. And I was, I, I didn't care, I was delighted that she made it. And I knew, I knew she was hung over. She was hung over every morning of my life, thrown up. Every, I woke up to that every morning. And I knew she was like that, because she was celebrating me the night before. Oh, my daughter is first degree in the family. Have a drink, have a drink, have a drink, right? As we do, you know how we are. And it really felt like that was the first experience of the steps working for me. Now, my father was a different experience. It was a lot of, my, my experience with my father, you know, when I first came, got sober, I thought, people were like, oh yeah, we only have one, one mother and one father and we should really make every effort, blah, blah, blah. And I tried. Um, I made a decision about five or six years sober not to have anything to do with my father. There was, I realized that my father was too unwell to meet me anywhere to meet me anywhere. Mentally, he was very unwell. And that was really hard. I kept putting myself in there and putting myself in there. And between outside help and my sponsor, 
were like, you know, I don't feel, when I did the steps, I hated them. When I did the steps, I kind of felt numb. Uh, and that was good enough. And um, he had a brain aneurysm when I was nine years sober. And I went home to Ireland eventually. And I went, and I was so sick, I wanted to drink. I was terrified to face my father. And I faced him, and um, I went into the hospital, and he was fast asleep. And the anger came up in me, and I was surprised by that. So I went to a meeting that night, and I shared about it. And somebody said, why don't, why don't you read page 552 of the big book? And so I did. And it's about, you know, praying for somebody, you know, that you're resentful at. I went the next day, and I allowed my father to hug me. I wiped his mouth. He was dribbling. He'd had this brain aneurysm, and it was just, went to the garden. We had nothing to say. I went to a meeting that night, and I did the same thing. And I went back the next day, and I told my father, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to see you anymore now. I'm leaving, going to California to live, and I won't see you anymore. And it was so hard for me. And he, he started to cry. And he just says, I'm going to miss you now. And I said, yeah. And I left. And I went into the chapel there, and I just cried for about an hour. I felt like such a relief. It was probably one of the hardest things I've had to do in my sobriety, but it was such a big relief for me. Like nine years it took me to get to that point, and so it's not my time, it's God's time. Like I'm not bullying my way through any of this stuff. It's God's time. I just get to lean into it. And uh, I went back for my father's funeral. He passed away four years ago, and I I went I went back for that, and... Um, I'm totally at peace of that. And the beautiful thing about it, because I take direction, is that I didn't have to explain myself. Like my brother was like, oh, we weren't expecting that. Why wouldn't I be here? I don't have to explain my business to you. Like I know what I'm at. I know what I'm at and I'm solid in that. And I was able to attend the funeral and be respectful and show up. And and I went to the graveyard that day and I brought some biscuits, you know, that my father used to love. And I put them on the grave and I felt like my father was saying, Jesus is my favorite you know, and I felt like I had a conversation with my father and I just cried the whole time at the graveside and it was a very healing experience for me and um, I don't regret that. But sometimes, you know, I I thought I was going to have to keep going at that and going at that. That wasn't the right thing for me and I have no regrets about that relationship at all. I'm totally free from it. Um, You know, for me, um, you know, I've been somebody who's been very driven sober I didn't know that about me like I sat on a bar stool and wet myself that's what I did like I was unable to work when I drank like I don't do anything when I drink I drink that's what I do and sober I've been able to get four degrees I got a doctorate two years ago and I've been able to you know I didn't I didn't know that like I've I've built like I've built a career for myself I've built a life for myself I've been in, in a in a relationship for the last 21 years we have a decent relationship or kind to each other I've been able to extend myself to other people and that's been really powerful for me to extend myself to other people has been really powerful and I I want to say this I had this experience when I was at home in Ireland and my wife really had a hard time and she left and came back here and I was on my own and it was a very painful time for me I was in this big house on my own and I was praying and there's a woman there who was really really unwell had other outside issues and she Everybody, nobody wanted to sponsor her. She asked me to sponsor her. And I was like, Jesus, you know, like I, I know I prayed in the morning for you to help a girl out, but you know, this is, this is a lot. Uh, and so of course I said yes, because what's the point in praying if I say no? Yes is always the right answer. So I say yes. And she was really, so I'd go and pick her up, right, in the morning. So I'd go and pick her up. And we'd, I'd be crying all the way there, because I'm in my own kind of little crisis going on, and I'd bring her for coffee and, I'd bring her for coffee and I'd say, what do you want to drink? And she'd, she was so damaged. She'd go, oh, I don't care anything you want. She couldn't make eye contact. So every week I got the same thing. And we I tried to interject the steps, but she was so unwell, she couldn't. So, and then I'd go to a meeting with her. And I did that every Friday for a couple of months, three months or something. And one night we're sitting in the car and she said to me, can I tell you something, Julie? And she was a much older woman than I was. And I said, of course you can. And she said to me, when I leave meetings, I, I go home and beat myself with a wooden spoon. And I started to cry in the car. I started to cry. And it caught me more off guard than it did her because I cared. I cared. It made me so sad that she would do that. And I was totally caught off guard because normally I'm so indifferent. Like, do you? You know, you want to see someone about that? You know, but I was totally, I started to cry. And she was stunned that I cried. And she said to me, you don't have to cry. And I said, it makes me so sad that you do that. And I really hope you find a God that is loving. And I drop her home and uh, I bring her for coffee uh, the next couple of days. And I bring her to coffee, right? 
And I pick her up and I bring her for coffee and I go, um, oh, what do you want? Do you want the same as me? And she looks up, no, I think I'll have something different today. I mean, and she, she looked, I didn't know they did all these different types of coffee. And I stood there, you know, and where the big book talks about, this is the bright spot. Like, I was elated to see her. And she got her own little drink because I cared about it. I was able to show it over time. This is the beauty of Alcoholics Anonymous. When I feel I have nothing to give, like I was in really dire straits then, emotionally. When I feel I have nothing to give and I and I offer it up and I give God the opportunity to help someone and then I say yes, she was such a gift to me. And nobody wanted her in the meeting. And she was such a gift to me. And it was so powerful, that experience for me. It's a beautiful experience and, um, not, you know, not to be indifferent anymore. And I, and, and now I cry adverts for Christ's sake. I'm like, oh, you know, like, like puppy or whatever, you know, so, so this is what I do, you know, like, um, life is in session for me. And, and, you know, my mother has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. It's been a very painful year for me. I've been home to Ireland twice. I'm going home again in June. We had to put her into a nursing home in November. I mean, it's been so painful. And um, it's hard to call her, and it's hard to hear her crying, and so hard. And uh, I just keep showing up, like Alcoholics Anonymous told me, even though I don't want to. I went home to Ireland to move her. My brother, my brothers left. They couldn't tolerate it. Oh, I don't, oh we couldn't manage that. And, you know, for me... Um, this is what I do in the morning. I have a sponsor. I have sponsees. I wake up in the morning. I'm, I'm, I'm still anxious when I wake up, right? Like, I always wake up going, oh my God, what day is it? And who wants something from me? Like, that's just how I wake up. Now, my wife wakes up singing, which I think is creepy, but it's okay, whatever. So, like, I wake up anxious like that and I go, oh, all right, prayer meditation. So I make myself some decent tea, proper tea, not like, I don't know what you lot are slinging around Lipton. I don't know. <laughs> Some property from Ireland, I make that. I do prayer meditation in the morning. Nothing fancy, 86 to 88. I read page 130, the big book, which talks about, we've come to believe a God who'd like to keep our head in the clouds with him, but our feet ought to be firmly planted on the earth. Because that is where our fellow travelers are. And that is where our work must be done. It's no good if I'm levitating all morning, and then I don't, I'm not able to translate that to people I meet during the day. And that's been uh, kind of interesting for me spiritually to extend myself in that way because, you know, I don't do not do people. But, um, you know, uh, and so that's what I do. And I call my sponsor daily. I uh, sponsor women. I go through the steps. I have commitments. Um, I go to regular three, four meetings a week. I have a career. Like, like I'm doing the deal and I'm a happy customer and I inconvenience myself regularly for Alcoholics Anonymous. I inconvenience myself. I could listen. I have it. I have everything I need. Do I really want to drive all the way to San Diego? No, I don't. But because I know the benefits that I get from driving here, then it really helps me stay sober and feel like I'm in the middle of bed in Alcoholics Anonymous. I never want to be on the periphery. I'm in the middle of the bed, and I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.